I'm really happy to be here today and have the opportunity to share some of the results from Look Ahead, looking at meal replacement and weight loss. And though I agree with uh, Rocco that weight loss shouldn't be everything, I'm going to focus on weight loss for this um, presentation. Um, these are my disclosures. And as an outline of the talk, I'll first be going over the rationale for using meal replacements in the Look Ahead study. Next, I'll be discussing some um, the partial meal replacement program that was used in the study, as well as key outcomes related to the use of a partial meal replacement program. And lastly, I'll be discussing some lessons learned about meal replacements from the study. All right, so um, weight management is typically recommended for patients with obesity and type 2 diabetes, as well as those who are overweight. And this is based on a number of short-term and long-term studies demonstrating that modest and sustained weight losses of 5% or more improve glycemic control as well, their, as well as other outcomes for individuals with diabetes. And we know that diet is one of the most important aspects of diabetes treatment. There are typically two types of energy-reduced diets that are recommended, the first being a very low-calorie diet that consists of less than 800 calories per day, and these are typically medically supervised programs that consist of meal replacements. There's also low-calorie diets that consist of about 1,200 to 1,600 calories per day, and these are um, split into different things like traditional uh, reduced-calorie diet plans where individuals use conventional food choices, there's also total meal replacement plans where individuals would substitute all of their meals with meal replacements. And then there's partial meal replacement plans that consist of a mixture of meal replacements as well as conventional foods. Um, so uh, in the United States, there's no defined term for meal replacements, but in some other areas such as Canada and Europe, there is a defined um, definition for what a meal replacement is. So it's a formulated food that can replace one or more meals they're calorie controlled and prepackaged, and in general, the calorie guidelines are 200 to 400 calories per serving and less than 30% of fat. They're also fortified with different sorts of vitamins and minerals so that individuals could meet their daily recommended allowance for different uh, nutrients. And there's um, some meal replacements that come in liquid form that are sort of ready to drink. There's powdered formulations that patients would need to stir and mix with water or low-fat milk, and there's some different meal replacement bars that people could have as well. Um, so there's a lot of great benefits to meal replacements. Um, for example, there's no food preparation and no cleanup, so they're really easy for patients to take on the go with them. They can help to reduce food shopping time. They're easy to carry and store and also have a fairly long shelf life. They often cost less than the meal that they would replace. And because individuals aren't selecting foods, there's also less temptation for tempting foods that might um, push them over their calorie amounts. It's also easier to self-monitor their food intake because the um, meal replacements have a set amount of calories. Um, for individuals with uh, type 2 diabetes, meal replacements can also offer some uh, benefits in terms of uh, more consistent carbohydrate intake, which ha can have some great benefits in terms of their glucose regulation. Um, we also know that individuals who are obese tend to underestimate their calorie intake of uh, conventional foods by about 40 to 50 percent, so it can help them be more accurate um, and then help to adhere uh, to their calorie carbohydrate as well as fat goals. Um, from a systematic review from Steve Hemsfield's um, group, there's also an increased weight loss of about three kilograms at one year um, uh, in individuals that take meal replacements compared to those taking self-selected diets of conventional foods. All right, so I'm going to focus on results from the Look Ahead study, which was a large randomized clinical trial examining the effects of an intensive lifestyle intervention versus the diabetes support and education control. And the primary outcome was looking at cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in over 5,000 individuals with overweight or obesity and type 2 diabetes. And there were 16 clinical centers across the United States, as you can see in this map, as well as the coordinating uh, center in um, Winston-Salem. Um, a brief overview of the participants. Um, all had type 2 diabetes. All had a BMI greater than 25 or greater than 27 if on insulin. They were 45 to 76 years of age, and they had the following metabolic uh, parameters. 
They were excluded if they had any sort of um, major psychiatric diagnosis that would interfere with their daily living, if they lost more than 10 pounds at baseline in the past three months, an Ill inability to walk more than two blocks, and any sort of history of bariatric surgery. Um, so the intensive lifestyle intervention was split into three phases. The first phase was the most intensive, where individuals met weekly for the first six months, and then three times per month from month seven to 12. And phase two is fo focused more on weight loss maintenance, and um, from years two to four, they had a minimum of two contacts per year. I'm sorry, per month. And then for year five and on, um, individuals met monthly. And there was a physical activity prescription that consisted of unsupervised activity for 175 minutes of moderate intensity activity per week, as well as 10,000 steps, as well as um, the following behavioral modification strategies, self-monitoring, stimulus control, problem solving, relapse prevention, goal setting, and motivational interviewing. In terms of the dietary prescription, for individuals who are less than 114 kilos, they were prescribed a 1,200 to 1,400 calorie per day program. And those over 114 kilos had a 1,500 to 1,800 calorie per day uh, dietary prescription with less than 30% of calories from fat and less than 10% from saturated fat. Participants also um, were recommended to record their daily food intake and calories using some food diaries that they were prescribed and provided with. All right, so for the partial meal replacement program, from weeks 1 to 12, individuals consumed a self-selected diet of conventional foods, meeting their calorie goals. And from weeks 3 to 26 um, was a partial meal replacement plan. And the plan consisted of two replacements of meal replacement shakes. Um, so say for breakfast and lunch, they would have a meal replacement that was about 220 calories. For meal three, they would have a 500 to 600 calorie dinner of uh, self-selected conventional food. And they also replaced one of their snacks with a meal replacement bar and then fruits and vegetables to make up their calorie amount. And individuals could choose between four different types of meal replacements, the first being Lucerna, the second being SlimFast, um, and both of those are liquid meal replacements. Um, and then they could choose OpiFast or HMR. And then from month seven on, um, individuals uh, could replace one meal and one snack per day with a meal replacement shake or bar, and they were prescribed a low energy density diet at their calorie amount using a structured meal plan. For the control group, um, the diabetes support and education control, it consisted of three group sessions per year focused on diet and nutrition, exercise and physical activity, and then social support. All right, so some of the baseline characteristics between the DSE and ILI groups. Um, so they were fairly well matched at baseline. Um, the mean age was about 59. Um, over half of the sample was female at um, just over 59%. The majority of the sample was white at 63%. Um, and there was a fairly good distribution in terms of individuals who were black and Hispanic. And the average age at baseline of diabetes was uh, 6.8 years. Um, the groups were fairly well matched also on clinical characteristics with the exception of systolic blood pressure. The average weight was 100 kilograms. Um, the average BMI was about 36. <clears throat> the mean A1C was about 7.3. All right, so in terms of year one meal consumption, for the first six months, individuals consumed an average of 233 meal replacements, which averages to about 9.7 per week during weeks three to 26 when they were on the most intensive meal replacement regimen. From months seven to 12, they consumed an average of 128 meal replacements, which averages to about 4.6 per week. And then this totals over the whole year about 360 meal replacements. And as you can see, there's a fairly large variability in terms of how many meal replacements people were having. Um, we also asked them how many meal replacements they ate um, how many weeks did they eat meal replacements in the past year? Um, again, this, was, uh, this is all uh, secondary and post hoc analyses, so looking at meal replacement usage wasn't the primary. Um, so this is one of the variables that I'll be using throughout the presentation. 
Um, so at baseline, a few people were um, using meal replacements, and you can see the large increase in usage of meal replacements, um, averaging to about 42 weeks of meal replacement usage in the ILI group. Um, and this shows some characteristics over the first year about who is most likely to use the most meal replacements. So as you can see here, males had significantly more meal replacement usage, um, both at six months and a year. People who were older were also more likely to use the meal replacements, and those who were non-Hispanic white. Uh, we found that um, from weeks 1 to 26, the number of meal replacements consumed was significantly associated with weight loss, as, um, and this was true also over the first year. So breaking that down a little bit, if we separate the groups into quartiles, looking at meal replacement usage, those who were, consumed the most meal replacements in the fourth quartile had 11.2% weight loss compared to 5.9% in those in the lowest quartile. Um, and categorically, we see here that individuals who met a 5% weight loss, which is a clinically significant weight loss, um, were more likely to have more uh, meal replacement consumption over the year compared to those who um, did not meet criteria, and same thing with 10 and 15 percent. All right, so now just a breakdown of meal replacements used, and this was only asked up until year four, um, but as you can see here um, in the blue, uh, glucerna and ultra simflast were the most popular liquid meal replacements used. We only had a few people who used powder meal replacements over um, the four years. And we're missing one, but a fairly good amount of, of people also used uh, different sort of bars, either slim fast bars or other sort of nutritional bars as well. Um, so some of the numbers, I think, got cut off for some reason, but that's supposed to go up to 52 weeks. Um, and, it has, and this is baseline year one, year four, and then year eight. And as you can see here, there was a decline in the use of meal replacements in the ILI group over time. And um, this is presenting it in a different way, but it shows um, I uh, classified people based on no meal replacements, um, over the year, 1 to 25 weeks per year, 26 to 51 weeks per year in the green, and then 52 weeks, so all the weeks in purple. Um, and as you can see here, the number of people who didn't use any meal replacements goes up over time, and then the number of people who um, had meal replacements for 52 weeks um, goes down. And at year four, there was about an even quarter split among all the groups. All right, so looking at meal replacements and weight loss longer term. At year four, we can see here that people in purple who consumed meal replacements for 52 weeks lost 6.9% of their body weight compared to 3.9% of the um, initial body weight for those who didn't consume any meal replacements. And we see a similar pattern for year eight as well, where people who are consuming the most meal replacements had the best weight loss maintenance at 7.5% um, among those consuming it at 52 weeks and 4.3% for those without any weeks. All right, and this is also looking at categorical weight losses um, and people who consumed the most meal replacements were more likely to meet criteria for five, 10, and 50% of initial weight loss at year four. And at year eight, they were more likely to meet criteria for um, five and 10%. Oh, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> that was not supposed to happen. Um, but at year four, you can see here in purple that people who are consuming the most meal replacements um, are, um, have the best weight losses. About 60% of them um, that the 5% weight loss criteria compared to about 40% who aren't consuming um, meal replacements. And then a similar pattern again at year eight. All right, so this is um, some changes in select cardiovascular risk factors. Um, you can see here um, the change from baseline to year one, baseline to year four, and baseline to 
um, year eight, there was a significant difference among the groups with the individuals who were consuming meal replacements um, for half or more of the year having better um, reductions in A1C, but it's extremely modest. Um, so you can see here at year eight, there were they lost, um, had a 0.2 decrease in A1C um, compared to 0.1 at zero weeks. So again, very modest and small differences, but statistically significant. There was no significant difference in LDL. And then for HDL, um, the groups um, who consumed meal replacements at 52 weeks um, had significantly better improvements, but again, modestly compared to those who had um, less frequent meal replacement consumption. All right, so um, there is no significant difference in discontinuation of any sort of diabetes medication based on meal replacements and um, no difference in the number of diabetes medications based on meal replacements used at years one, four, and eight. Um, part of the reason um, why this may be is because um, individuals were proactively managed for their hypoglycemia. So because they were going on such a reduced calorie diet, um, the investigators were very concerned about hypoglycemia. So before the intervention started, when people were kind of using their self-selected diet, um, any participant who is at high risk for hypoglycemia, so that's people who are on insulin, glenodides, or sulfur and ureas, um, uh, had to monitor their blood sugar twice a day for a week, and this was reviewed by a clinician. Individuals who had two or more blood sugars that were less than 100 reduced their meds by 0 to 50% prior to the intervention. Those who had three or more blood sugars from 80 to 100 reduced their meds by 25 to 75%. And those who had three or more blood sugars less than 80 or symptoms of severe hypoglycemia reduced their meds by 50 to 100% prior to the start of the intervention. Once the intervention started, so the low calorie diet meal replacements, people continued to monitor their blood sugar twice a day um, for a whole week and then continued to review it if they had any sort of symptoms of hypoglycemia. They'd restart um, this sort of protocol for uh, medication adjustment. Um, if someone's blood sugar was kind of stable and they were doing just fine, they could reduce the frequency of uh, blood sugar monitoring, but they continued um, to do some, which was reviewed at one to two month intervals. Um, at the end of the meal replacement diet, too, um, there was an adjustment of medications upward, um, if indicated. Um, and because of this, um, there uh, were uh, significantly more uh, hypoglycemia events in um, the ILI group in the first year. You can see the overall amount of events is very low, 19, um, compared to 5 in the DSC, but it is significantly uh, statistically significant, um, but at all the, for the remainder of the trial, there was no significant differences between the groups. All right, so in conclusion, um, adherence to meal replacement uh, plans is necessary in order for there to be a benefit, and it's really important to proactively address the barriers to meal replacements. Um, so one of them being hypoglycemia, which I just reviewed. Some patients also have a lot of resistance to structure, which is important to address prior to starting the program, um, addressing different sort of social and family concerns. Participants were also given a taste test at the beginning so they could pick pick which meal replacement um, that they wanted to use. Um, and also taste fatigue is a really big issue with meal replacements. Um, so individuals were taught different strategies about altering the flavor as well as texture of the meal replacements, such as adding different extracts or spices, um, freezing the meal replacements to create sort of a, like a frosty, um, uh, warming it up to make something like hot chocolate or even adding something like coffee if they like a more bitter taste. Um, so I've shown you that use of meal replacements dimish, diminished over the eight years of the trial. However, consistent use of meal replacements in combination with lifestyle modification helped to facilitate long-term weight loss as well as improve glycemic control. And I'd like to acknowledge the wonderful Look Ahead clinical team, so all of the different <laughs> clinical sites um, that uh, were so dil diligent in recruiting and retaining the Look Ahead participants. Also, the Look Ahead Centers, including the Coordinating Center and the Central Resource Centers. The very generous funding sources um, from the National Institute of Health, um, as well as uh, CDC, Department of Veterans Affairs, and Indian Health Service for funding the study. 
And um, also a special acknowledgement to the different groups who helped to supply the uh, meal replacements, including Abbott Nutrition, who uh, produces glucerna. Thank you.